Welcome back to the yeah. Darting Through the Faith podcast. I'm Julia Mon, and with me, as always, Father Sean Wilson. Father Sean, how are you today? Oh my gosh, I'm great, Julia. <laughs> I'm great. You can how restart you? if you don't want to do that. Oh no, that's great. You did a great job. I think you just got yourself a new job. No, no, no. Gosh, no. That's in my contract. I don't get new jobs or throw the dart or... But. No, the dart's in the contract, but <clears throat> lead, bat and lead off, maybe... <laughs> You might have just, no. here, you want the torch? No, no, no. You Take do such torch. a great job. But, but you were teasing about eating flies, and I was trying to get you off guard here. And it, anyway, we began. Yeah. Plus, Grace has to get to the dentist today, so we had to get she started. She has to get to the dentist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Yeah. So we had to get moving. I mean, eating flies, I, let's just, just so everybody knows, at Daily Mass today, I told the people at Daily Mass, a fly got in with the host, had part of the sacred species on him, and so... I just consumed the fly. Like in the chalice, after I purified it, it was in with the water and drank the fly. It's fine. Mm -hmm. But it is unique. Mm -hmm. And somebody told me after Mass, Father, you're just full of surprises. And <laughs> I, I thought, well, so is God, because I wasn't planning on doing that today. Right. You know, I didn't think agenda. I was going to have a high-protein diet today, but here mm -hmm. we are. Listen, I, it was worthy of a very sincere thank you. Like, our Lord is worth that. Our Lord... Mm -hmm is worth that. There were yeah. particles of his body on that fly. They needed to be properly consumed. So thank you. You're I welcome. mean that in all seriousness. I know you do. I know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, so sometimes the day starts in ways you don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> and then it continues in ways you didn't think were going to happen. And that's okay. Yeah. Right. So praise God. Yeah. Praise God. Mm-hmm. 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 So I'm like, off kilter since I started. Like, do you feel that? Like, I feel yeah weird. Weird. <laughs> well, yeah. <clears throat> since you didn't officially announce us, it's okay. Okay, it's okay. But yeah. do you want me to pray? Oh, gosh. you don't want to like take the opening prayer too, and we'll just like trade seats. No. Oh, gosh. Okay. No. I'm just asking, Julia. No, I, I just, know. I want to pray. I'm I'm up for whatever. You know, we could. You know, yeah. I've eaten flies. Whatever. Somebody did say though, very John the Baptist of you. Yeah. 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 Which, yeah. Truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now I'm thinking like John the Baptist, I get the honey, mm -hmm. right? To be able to like chase something like that with some honey. Like that That would have helped. Yeah, it would have <laughs> helped. Um but it's fine. I mean oh. it's it's yeah. Mm -hmm. But thank you. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist is a great man. Serious question though. Since okay. we're talking about John the Baptist. Yeah. Um second week of Advent is where we are now. Like what is the theme this second week of Advent? Like what are you pondering this second week of Advent? Oh, I'm pondering St. Joseph, to be honest. Yeah? So because <clears throat> Sister Miriam James Heidlin, you know her? Sister Miriam James, she yeah, does a lot of speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah So yeah. she had a book come out, it, four weeks of Advent reflection with the Holy Family. Okay. The first week was all about Mary. So there's like a daily mm. like prayer, journaling, and uh, and more prayer. Mm -hmm. And so I did the first week with Mary, mm -hmm. and the second week's with St. Joseph, the third mm. week's with the child Jesus, and the fourth week's with the entire Holy Family. Mm. It's called Behold. So. Nice. So I'm pondering St. Joseph. It's not particularly tied to the the readings of the week, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. you asked and that's what's happening. That's good. Yeah. I love that. that yeah. That's a great answer. Yeah. I got myself a little uh, reflection book on like reflections with Padre Pio throughout mm. Advent, which I am really enjoying. Yeah. Um, not only like all his miracles and everything, but just his childlike love for the child Jesus. It's mm. really inspiring. Yeah. That's great. That's beautiful. And then, of course, all this John the Baptist, like repentance, prepare your heart. Is your heart prepared? Like, that's good stuff, too. Yeah. Mm. You brood of vipers. Yes. I was so bummed. So I was so bummed. Father Michael Willig, our parochial vicar, gave a great homily this weekend, and he made a joke about Christmas cards and tied it into John the Baptist. Did I he heard tell about, you the joke? No, somebody else told me. So he's like, you know, talking about how sweet these Christmas cards are, and they're always about joy and rejoice, and they have a beautiful family on the front, perhaps even the holy family itself. But can you imagine sending a card with John the Baptist with his camel hair and locusts and honey, and then where you just open it up, and it says, you brood of vipers. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like... Missed opportunity. Yeah. Just ordered my Christmas cards. Darn. Ah, file that one for next right, year. Right next year. Yeah. Father Willing's getting his own card. Yeah, handmade. <laughs> no. That's right. Brood of vipers. Yeah. That's good stuff. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Maybe we should do that from the rectory. You know, yes. John the Baptist. You brood of vipers. Merry Christmas from the priests of the Petersburg parish parishes. <laughs> parishes. Yeah, do that. I think that would be great. I, yeah, I think people would yeah. really appreciate if it. If you need funding for that, I would be happy to donate to it. Oh, okay. Cool. Postage has gone up. You <laughs> it know? has. It's yeah, for real. Uh, mailing. Real. 
mm-hmm. shipping costs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, again, Grace has to get to the dentist today, so yeah. we should probably pray. And That's continue. right. All right. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Lord, we give you thanks for the Holy Spirit that pours out upon us and for drawing us into your church. We ask that you may give us a deep appreciation for living in your church and the vehicle of salvation it is for us, and ask that you may be with all those who have strayed from your church, that you may heal wounds of division within your church, and it may strengthen strengthen all of us to live as beloved brothers in the Lord's house. Ask us all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We the are. The church is one found. Right? Sing it, <coughs> right? The church is one. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It and is one. That song. And it is holy. It is holy. And that is what we're talking about. It's also Catholic and apostolic, but we're not talking about that. No. I think we already did apostolic. I think we did too. I don't know if we did Catholic. I, judging from the zero highlights and writing in the Catholic part in my catechism, I don't mm-hmm. think we've covered the Catholic part. I think you're right. But I think we have covered the apostolic. So we're talking about these four characteristics that are inseparably linked with each other. They sound familiar because we say them in the creed, right? True. We proclaim them in the creed. Mm -hmm. And today we're talking about the church is one, and then the church is holy. Paragraphs 813 through 829. Is that right? Is that what you wrote down? That's what I had. That's what I prepared, too. Okay, good. I just wondered about paragraph 811 and 812, like the intro. I think they got the short straw. They did, I think. Um, Yeah. (laughs) I think they did get the short straw. So that's, that's homework for everybody. Mm-hmm. If you want, like to know what those paragraphs are about, read them. Be an overachiever like me. Go ahead and read them. Oh, I did, did you see do them, that? and I'm like, those aren't going to get anywhere. They're just intro to what we're talking about. What we just said: the four characteristics, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic, and then we're going to dissect all of those. So, um, where the, are we in the catechism? Sorry. Well, first, they're generally a lot of times called the four marks of the church. Okay. So, like marks, like identifying characteristics. Mm-hmm. So, you might have heard the four marks of the church. Mm-hmm. So that's the same thing. Very good. Yeah. Good. I was going to ask, like, where are we at in the catechism section-wise? We're in the creed part. You know, mm-hmm. in the creed, it breaks down the creed. And as you mentioned already, the creed professes one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Right. So we are in the first part of the catechism, mm-hmm. all about the creed, the part on the church. Mm-hmm. Good. That was, a, that was a trick question. Yeah. That was one of those, it's so easy, don't get it wrong questions. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I need those. You know, confidence builder. That's right. Ugh. Funny story. I was uh, helping with uh, CCD not too long ago, some some young people. And so I asked the question, uh, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew? But before I asked the question, I literally said, this isn't a trick question. Mm. Who wrote the Gospel of Matthew? And you should have heard some of the answers that I was getting. They were quite funny. <laughs> um, I Moses? Uh, I don't know. They were just really off the wall. Like, were they joking? I think people were messing with me. Oh, I have a lot of nieces and nephews in that class. I think oh, they were messing with me. Yeah. But anyway, that was funny. Yeah, that We're is funny, on. though. Okay, so the church is one. Paragraph 813. Mm-hmm. It's one because of her source. It's one because of her founder. It's one because of her soul. So first, because of her source, God the Father. Right? Yeah. Well, the whole Trinity, right? Mm-hmm. And so as the Trinity is one, right? We believe in one Trinity, a single mm-hmm. divine uh, Godhead with three persons. So there's this unity within the Trinity, and the church images that, right? Mm-hmm. This unity that exists in the church because God is one. Mm-hmm. So because God is one, there the church is one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One because of her founder, the Word made flesh, the Prince of Peace, reconciled all men to God by the cross. So the source is the Father. Mm-hmm. The founder is the uh, is the son, right? Mm-hmm. The savior who mm-hmm. in, begins the church. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ our Lord, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The church is one founder, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the church is one because of her soul, mm-hmm. the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. the one that animates the entire church. The Holy Spirit dwelling in those who believe and pervading and ruling over the entire church brings about the wonderful communion of the faithful. I love the idea of the Holy Spirit ruling over the church. Uh. Like, because you think about a ruler as the one who directs, right? Not like a aggressive authoritarian ruler, but the ruler of the one that guides, that directs, that um, sets the direction. Mm-hmm. That's the Holy Spirit for the mm-hmm. church. Or at least it ought to be, unless mm-hmm. we put ourselves in that position. Mm-hmm. So I love that. I can't stop thinking about either. I know this is like common. You said it in the episode last week when we were talking about the Holy Spirit. That was just last week, right? But you were talking mm-hmm. about the com- the commonality of like viewing the Holy Spirit as like the breath, right? Mm-hmm. That we need that breath. 
I had never heard it put that way before. Mm. I live under a rock sometimes. I'm like, that's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wow. I love that. Yeah. Even like the, like, you know, just pondering that all week. So anyway, thank you for that. Um, That's from Jesus. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so what an astonishing mystery. What, who are we quoting here? We are quoting St. Clement of Alexandria. Mm. What an astonishing mystery. There is one Father of the universe, one Logos of the universe, and also one Holy Spirit, everywhere one and the same. There is also one virgin become mother, and I should like to call her church. Yes, mm-hmm. we've talked about that in the past, the church being um, Holy Mother Church, right? right. Okay, right. So the bride of Christ, but mm-hmm. the church, our mother. Mm-hmm. So. The, the church always has this feminine identity mm-hmm. because she's in a relationship with uh, with Christ mm-hmm. and then mothers us, the people of God. Mm-hmm. So good. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, from the beginning, this one church has been marked by a great diversity, which comes from both the variety of God's gifts and the diversity of those who receive them. Um, the great richness of such diversity, however, is not opposed to the church's unity. Sin and the burden of its consequences constantly threaten the gift of unity. Okay. So yes, we're diverse. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's doesn't, but that doesn't interfere with the oneness that is the church. So you've got like the unity mm-hmm. and the diversity exists under that. Mm-hmm. So within the, the diversity or within the unity, there's diversity. Mm-hmm. So think, think about a family, right? Mm-hmm. All, all the kids in a family, like you and your siblings, you're not all the same person. Mm-hmm. There's a diversity of gifts. There's a diversity of personalities. There's a diversity of ways of living. Mm-hmm. And, and the same thing goes for the church, but you're united in a single family. Mm-hmm. I mean, all of us grew up in a family where we weren't the only person there, you mm-hmm. know, even if it's just our parents and, and ourselves. So, so that's, that's like the diversity. It's not like, um, the, the, the church, there's multiple churches, right? And that's the diversity, but the church is one before there's a diversity of gifts and ways to live. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so the apostle Paul exhorts Christians to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's in Ephesians four. And then the catechism breaks down in the next paragraph, paragraph 815. What are these bonds of unity that Paul is talking about here that keep us as one? Well, one above all is charity, right? Charity binds everything together in perfect harmony. And then it breaks down the visible bonds of communion, visible bonds of communion, Profession of one faith received from the apostles, the common celebration of divine worship, especially of the sacraments, and the apostolic succession through the sacrament of holy orders, maintaining the fraternal concord of God's family. So this that we're reflecting on, Mm -hmm. the catechism, Mm -hmm. a bond of unity. Because you and I have the same beliefs Mm -hmm. and we're part of the same church that believes the same thing, whether it's, you know, this book translated into Korean Mm -hmm. or, you know, Arabic, whatever it may be, we have this unity of our faith. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one of the the visible bonds of unity. Also the bishops, right? The bishops in succession to the apostles and that kind of the, the unity in the person of the Pope even, right? Because they're in, um, in, uh, in union with the Pope. So, so like he's the the figurehead of this unity. Mm-hmm. We got the same Holy Father. Mm-hmm. We're all part of the same family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then the celebration of the sacraments. Mm-hmm. Right. You can walk into any Catholic church now. Different rites. Right. So it's going to look this. It's going to look differently. Mm-hmm. But at, at the root of it, we're offering the sacrifice of the Son to the Father and receiving the body of the Son. Mm-hmm. So it might look different. Mm-hmm. Right. You go to a Byzantine liturgy or whatever it may be, but. Boy, howdy. And that's, that goes back to kind of what we said earlier about the diversity. Like mm-hmm. that falls sort of into that category. Yeah. Like our, our unity is above all of that. But then we have this diversity that doesn't in any way, though, divide us Wound. as, as yeah. the one. Mm-hmm. There are things that do divide us, and we're going to yes. get to that. Yes, yes, yes. Shall we do that now? Um, was there anything in 816 you wanted to touch on? Yeah, yeah. So the the word is, so this church constituted and organized as a society in the present world subsists in the Catholic church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. Mm-hmm. So it's identifying the one church as the Catholic church, right? So the, the one church subsists in, exists in the Catholic church. So that's not to say like um, the church is like some, and you'll get this, like there's an invisible church in which you're, we're united and then our, and that's the big C church. And then these little C churches like denominations, well, that's where the diversity is. Mm-hmm. That is not the Catholic understanding of the church. That's a lot of other 
understandings of the church, and you'll you'll hear I I'll I've hear, heard people say mm-hmm. that not normally Catholics non Catholics will say there's the big C church in which we're all united invisibly by the Holy Spirit, um, which is a nice thought, mm-hmm. but the church is t- taught, and the example of the Acts of the Apostles is that visible unity is is important, and so the one church of Christ subsists in exists in the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. What's the catechism saying? Mm-hmm. Is that arrogant? Well, you know, you can judge that for your people can judge that for yourselves, but it's hard to hard to say anything else is logical, mm-hmm. right? To mm-hmm. to have some sort of invisible unity when there's visible disunity. Like that's a that's a head scratcher. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. and that were these next couple paragraphs that talk about talk about this more, the wounds mm-hmm. to unity. Yeah. So this is the ideal, this is you know, what Christ established in his church, but here are the wounds. Here's what's impacted that along the way, right? It's what Jesus wants too. You think in John chapter 16, his prayer to the Father, his dying words at the Last Supper is, Father, let them all be one. May they be one in me just as you and I are one in each other. I think that's John 17. Fair enough. But it's beautiful words. Yeah. They are are beautiful words, right? Um, They are. um, So these wounds to unity in 817... Um, men of both sides are to blame. First of all, that points that out in there. In fact, in this one and only church of God from its very beginnings, there arose certain rifts, which the apostle strongly censure, censures are damnable. But in subsequent centuries, much more serious dissensions appeared, and large communities became separated from full communion with the Catholic Church, for which, often enough, men of both sides were to blame. The ruptures that wound the unity of Christ's body, here we must distinguish heresy, apostasy, and schism do not occur without human sin. So again, it's not the diversity that's creating this this disunity, but sin, mm-hmm. sin itself, right? Right. And so, um, you know, it talks about at the very beginning, we see disunity mm-hmm. because it, as in Paul's letters, right? Some, in, I think it's the letter to the Galatians. Some say they belong to Peter. Some say they belong to Paul. Mm-hmm. Some to Apollo. Some to, you know, all these different guys. And Paul's like, no, that that's not, that's not, you're not divided versus who your apostle is. We're, we're in one body of Christ. And so Paul, even so early on, is fighting disunity and, and schisms and separation. And unfortunately, it only gets worse as time goes on, mm-hmm. right? The the disunity, and there's there's major breaks of unity. And the, an honest thing that the catechism rec- uh, recognizes is that it's our own sin. Mm-hmm. Both sides of disunity, it's, um, it's our own sin. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the, so in 1054, there's a big schism between Eastern Christianity and Western Christianity. You know, the the Roman Empire had moved its seat from Rome to Constantinople. So there's a, a bishop, the patriarch of Constantinople is kind of in the, the head of the Eastern Church, and you've got the, the, um, the, the Pope in Rome. And in 1054, they excommunicate each other. And it's like, well, that's a pretty clear sign that both of them are mm-hmm. to blame. Now, Hundreds of years later, in the 1960s or 70s, Paul VI and the Patriarch of Constantinople, Pope Paul VI, St. Paul VI, lift the mutual excommunications. Mm. 900 years later, wow. hey, we did it. Right. <laughs> nice. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so, um, mm. so both sides are to blame, I guess, mm-hmm. is to po- point that mm-hmm. out. Um, this continues saying, however, one cannot charge with the sin of the separation those who at present are born into these communities that resulted from such separation and in them are brought up in the faith of Christ and the Catholic Church accepts them with respect and affection as brothers. All who have been justified by faith in baptism are incorporated into Christ. They therefore have a right to be called Christians and with good reason are accepted as brothers in the Lord by the children of the Catholic Church. So this is this disunity is a reality. Mm-hmm. It's a sad reality, but it is a reality. Oh, it's a wound against unity is how this section is describing sure. it. Um, and that that is the reality. We can't push that aside. However, what this is saying is one cannot charge with the sin of separation. Those who are at present are born into these communities. So we have all these dif- divisions of Christianity, right. and you're born into, you know, a, a, outside of the Catholic Church, let's say, that you're not... To right. blame for that. That's what this is saying. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that example of the mutual excommunications in mm-hmm. 1054. Now, if I went to somebody who's an Eastern 
orthodox Christian and say, hey, you guys, you're to blame for blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. No, he's not. Mm -hmm. She's not. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the sins of the past. And mm -hmm. so um, so then what, what do you do? You know, you've got to follow your conscience, right? Mm -hmm. And to allow the Holy Spirit to kind of guide, direct uh, that conscience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. And, right, we believe that the conscience wants... Our, the Holy Spirit at work in our conscience wants to unite people, mm -hmm. right? He wants to He wants to restore the unity that was there in the upper room at Pentecost. Mm -hmm. right? That's ultimately the goal of the Holy Spirit is to draw people um, together. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, furthermore, many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside the visible confines of the Catholic Church, the written word of God, the life of grace, faith, hope, and charity, with the other interior gifts of the Holy Spirit, as well as visible elements. Christ's Spirit uses these churches and ecclesial communities as means of salvation whose power derives from the fullness of grace and truth that Christ has entrusted to the Catholic Church. All these blessings come from Christ and lead to Him and are in themselves calls to Catholic unity. So basically there's nothing good outside the church that's not also within the church. Now, there, there might be things that are lived better, right? Mm. So um, let's just say another church here in town might have a pastor that's much smarter in sacred scripture than I do, and I dare say a lot of them probably <laughs> do. Um, but that that's not to say that the scriptures that they experience, that they delve into, are also present in the Catholic Church, right? Or there might be a somebody who's really open to the Holy Spirit and at work at the Holy Spirit to lead, to guide their lives, mm -hmm. much more so than somebody in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. But that same Holy Spirit that's present there and the teachings about the authentic understanding of the Holy Spirit is also present in the Catholic Church. So, um, and off it, and, the, and then there's more, right? Mm -hmm. There's things that we have that are that are that are present that aren't present in it. You know, there's no other churches that anybody's going to the sacrament of reconciliation mm -hmm. to other than the Catholic Church. So, but anything that's good there, that's good in those churches, and it's authentically good, right? Mm -hmm. The the prayer that people offer, the scriptures that they study, the um, the openness to the Holy Spirit, that's all genuinely good. Mm -hmm. It comes from. You know, in some ways, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it comes from us, right? Because mm -hmm. the scriptures, the Catholic Church kind of kept those, cherished those, mm -hmm. passed them down. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the power derives from the fullness of grace and truth. I think that's the key word, mm -hmm. the fullness of grace and truth. So it's not that it's um, that, again, like you said, if it's authentically good, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. Sure. It's just missing perhaps the fullness of grace yeah. and truth. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. There's okay. a, uh, you know, there's a book by a guy by <clears throat> C.S. Lewis who wrote in the middle of the 1900s, really famous British author mm -hmm. called Mere Christianity. And he wanted to describe kind of the basics of Christianity in that book. And it was really popular. It's a really good, good, mm -hmm. good read. He was an Anglican man. Mm -hmm. So there's a, uh, there's a man in the United States who's, who's alive now. He's Father Dwight Longnecker, who was an Anglican priest and converted to Catholicism. And he wrote a little bit about his journey and what he found in a book called More Christianity mm. to basically say why he converted to Catholicism is that he found more. Mm. He found more in the sacramental life and the understanding of sin and virtue and all of this. So it wasn't as if he was rejecting what he had, but he found more mm. in the Catholic Church, and that's mm. what drew him in. Mm. So more Christianity. So that mm. I think that mm -hmm. hits that paragraph mm -hmm. there, 819. Yeah. Um, the next few paragraphs then, so that those, those again, those were a section called... Uh, wounds to unity. And now it's a, a section called toward unity. So how do we continue to work toward greater unity? Yes. Um, Christ bestowed unity on his church from the beginning. This unity we believe subsists in the Catholic church is something she can never lose. And we hoped that it will continue to increase until the end of time. Christ always gives his church the gift of unity, but the church must always pray and work to maintain, reinforce, and perfect the unity that Christ wills for her. This is why Jesus himself prayed at the hour of his passion and does not cease praying to his Father for the unity of his disciples, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be one in us, so that the world may know that you have sent me. The desire to recover the unity of all Christians is a gift of Christ and a call of the Holy Spirit. And then the next paragraph breaks down these certain things that are required in order to respond adequately to this call, to this call of unity. Um, a permanent renewal of the church in greater fidelity to her vocation, conversion of heart as the faithful, for it is the unfaithfulness of the members of Christ's gift which causes divisions. Again, 
the um, diversity is not the issue. It's sin itself that is the issue. Prayer in common, fraternal knowledge of each other, ecumenical formation, dialogue among theologians, um, collaboration among Christians in various areas of service to mankind. So these are things that we can do to tend toward greater unity. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's it's so often it seems hopeless, mm-hmm. right? I, I was, uh, well, maybe 10, 12 years ago, I was working alongside a, a man who was in formation to be, I think it was a, gosh, Assembly of God minister, really great, great young man. And we had this discussion about working towards unity. And he had this like sense of like, it's never going to happen, mm-hmm. right? Like unity between Christians is like, like we can, is it something even worth working towards? Cause it just seems mm-hmm. so far fetched that is it even worth happening? And I think there's genuinely there's right. How many people have the goal of like Christian unity, mm-hmm. like completely reunited? Mm-hmm. God does. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but these like building blocks, like, it, when that can seem so far off, I think mm-hmm. these building blocks are great because it's like, oh, we need to constantly renew. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to be co- converted so that it, our sins are not the cause of disunity. Mm-hmm. And man, that's whew, mm-hmm. if our our sins separate people, oh, that's a mm-hmm. that's a tough pill to swallow. Prayer in common. Mm-hmm. There's always a lot of great opportunities to pray in common. Knowledge of each other, dialogue amongst theologians, collaboration in various. Um, opportunities of human service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, touching on this, this reality that it's so hopeless. And, um, I mean, for us, for man, it is, it is, it's beyond anything we can do as human beings. And yet that's what Jesus is saying here in that John 17, that is quoted in paragraph 820, that, um, that I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may know that you have sent me. So that when God, when Christ, or when God through Christ does draw us all together, then we know that, hey, this wasn't our doing. This is Christ doing it mm-hmm. himself. That, that the world may know that it is, he is who he says he is, right? right? The, the one to actually do this. Um, and even, yeah. you know, you think about our disunity is really a scandal to the whole world of unbelievers, Mm -hmm. right? The fact that our churches are that Christians are so divided. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in some ways it's just so hypocritical Mm -hmm. of what we're called to bring, what we're called to draw people into. I mean, the fact that we're can't agree on certain fundamental truths, like that's a, that's a sign. So that's right. When, when there's unity, that's a sign that, that God is real. Mm -hmm. And now we know that God is real, right? Mm -hmm. We know that he's alive, that Jesus really rose from the dead. But, you know, from the outside looking in, Mm -hmm. all the divisions like, "Eh, really? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And even some of the finger pointing that happens, oh, you're going to talk about forgiveness, but you just want to wag the finger at somebody else. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mm -hmm. fair enough, you know. Mm -hmm. Gosh, we're guilty of that, right? So that's why Mm -hmm. it's our own sin Mm -hmm. that causes division. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, This last, to end this section, the church is one. Concern for achieving unity involves the whole church, faithful and clergy alike, but we must realize that this holy objective, the reconciliation of all Christians in the unity of the one and only church of Christ, transcends human powers and gifts. That is why we place all our hope in the prayer of Christ for the church, in the love of the Father for us, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen, amen. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So now we go into the section of the church is holy, which we hear this again, like we were just talking about um, the church is one mm-hmm. and why there is disunity, and again, not because of our diversity, but because of our sin. And now we're going to talk about the church is holy. Well, how how can the church be holy when it's made up of a bunch of sinners? When I'm in it. Exactly. Right? Like there's, there's a sense of that. Like when we're in it and yeah. we know our sins so well, mm-hmm. hopefully, uh, it seems like that's not holy then. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So this... So. This teaches us about how that is possible. Right. Um, So 823. Uh, The church is held as a matter of faith to be unfailingly holy. This is because Christ, the Son of God, who with the Father and the Spirit is hailed as alone holy, loved the church as his bride, giving himself up for her so as to sanctify her. He joined her to himself as his body and endowed her with the gift of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God. The church then is the holy people of God, and her members are called saints. So the church is unfailingly holy. Because, not because of us, mm-mm. not because of our perfection, mm-hmm. but because of Christ. Christ. Christ dying for us as the bridegroom, uniting himself with us, the bride, sanctifying us mm-hmm. through his death. Mm-hmm. Our source, our founder, 
our mm-hmm. soul mm-hmm. in the Lord. That's why we're holy, not mm-hmm. because of us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so that's good. It doesn't depend on us, the yeah. holiness of the church. Praise God. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God for that. Um, united with Christ, the church is sanctified by him, through him, and with him. She becomes sanctifying. Oh, mm. okay. Right? So through Christ, the mm-hmm. church helps us to become holy, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To be a saint. Mm-hmm. All the activities of the church are directed toward their end to the sanctification of men in Christ and the glorification of God. It is in the church that the fullness of the means of salvation has been deposited. It is in her that by the grace of God we acquire holiness. So there we have it again. It's in the church that the fullness of the means of salvation, Mm -hmm. right? The fullness of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So we want to become holy, right? We are on this path, and the church helps us to become holy is what this is saying. And Mm -hmm. intuitively, hopefully we know that, Mm -hmm. that we're we're not going to be able to do this on our own. If we had to think up Christianity and do it on our own, we would would struggle to be holy. It's Mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's like trying to learn the piano without having a teacher, Mm -hmm. right? Um, and even maybe even beyond that. So, so everything we need though is in the church Mm -hmm. and the fullness of what we need to become holy is in the church, the sacraments, Mm -hmm. the moral life, the teachings, the encouragement to prayer, the, all those things Mm -hmm. they're Mm -hmm. here. The church on earth is endowed already with a sanctity that is real though imperfect. I really loved that. It's endowed already with a sanctity that is real, though mm-hmm. imperfect. In her members, perfect holiness is something yet to be acquired. Strengthened by so many and such great means of salvation, all the faithful, whatever their condition or state, though each in his own way, are called by the Lord to that perfection of sanctity by which the Father himself is perfect. Here it is, the universal call to holiness, right? Mm -hmm. We are all called to be saints. No matter what your vocation is, no matter what your state of life is, we are all called to be holy, to be perfect as our Father is perfect. And if we don't believe that, Mm -hmm. right? And there's part of us that you know, we because of our own struggle with holiness, we Mm -hmm. struggle to believe that. Mm -hmm. But if we don't believe that God can do this in some ways, we're doubting that he is who he says yes. he is, right? Like if we don't believe he can be, he can transform us into be a saint, mm-hmm. then we're in many ways doubting his mm-hmm. goodness, his ability, his omnipotence, his power, mm-hmm. his wisdom. So, um, so we're called to be this. And if we think, well, the saints for other people, not me, mm-hmm. then we got to recheck our understanding of who God is. Mm-hmm. Truth. Mm. Charity is the soul of holiness to which all are called. It governs, shapes, and perfects all the means of sanctification. Guess what's next? A quote from St. Therese. <laughs> Sorry, I got really excited about that. Yeah, I was like, there was an awkward <laughs> pause there. Is... Pause for effect. Yeah. It's a quote I... from St. Therese about charity. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know if you were about ready to burp or... <laughs> You know, something like that. Like you just pause no, and like, better. if I keep talking, something's going to erupt out of here. I mean, I've never done that. Today. No. Today. <laughs> this oh, so St. Therese, a little flower. Greatest saint of modern times. Uh, what, what Pope said that? Pius IX. Yeah. Who canonized her, yeah? Well, no, it wasn't no. Pius. Sorry. No. <laughs> Pius XI. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If the church was a body composed of different members, it couldn't lack the noblest of all. It must have a heart and a heart burning with love. And I realized that this love alone was the true motive force which enabled the other members of the church to act. If it ceased to function, the apostles would forget to preach the gospel. The martyrs would refuse to shed their blood. Love, in fact, is the vocation which includes all others. It's a universe of its own, comprising all time and space. It's eternal. So again, charity is the soul of of holiness. It's love. Like we think of, we are um, many parts, but we're one body, right? And we have people who are preaching, people who are martyred, people people who are um, giving their lives in acts of service. And Therese is wanting to be all those things Mm -hmm. and realizing she can be none of them because she's just a little humble soul who's very sick and weak and can't do anything behind the uh, the grill of her cloister and she realizes ah alas i know my vocation my vocation is love to be love in the heart of the church so anyway that's beautiful Mm -hmm. she's great because that's the heart of all of those other vocations Mm -hmm. right the one to go out and be a missionary the one to be a martyr right at the the heart of that the soul of Mm -hmm. all of those is love Mm -hmm. right no greater love does anybody have than to lay down one's life for one's friends. That's the mm-hmm. martyr's life. We just celebrated St. Francis of St. Francis Xavier's feast day, and he goes all over the world because he's burning with love. So 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even uh, the catechism itself in the prologue, which was the very first episode we did Mm. many times ago, the prologue ends that above all, it's charity. So to conclude this prologue, it is fitting to recall this pastoral principle stated in the Roman catechism. The whole concern of doctrine and its teachings must be directed to the love that never ends. Whether something is proposed for belief, for hope, or for action, the love of our Lord must always be made accessible so that anyone can see that all the works of perfect Christian virtue spring from love and have no other objective than to arrive at love. Dang. Dang. Paragraph 25. Dang. <laughs> uh, okay, continuing. Uh, 827. The church, however, clasping sinners to her bosom Mm. and at once holy and always in need of purification, follows constantly the path of penance and renewal, Mm. right? So this recognition that all of the church's sons and daughters are sinners, but the church holds them close, Mm -hmm. not wags the finger at them Mm -hmm. uh, to invite them to Mm. holiness, to give them this path of perseverance because, boy, it's hard, that that path of conversion. Oh, yes. All members of the church, including her ministers, must acknowledge that they are sinners. Yeah, hence the church gathers sinners already caught up in Christ's salvation, but still on the way to holiness. The church is therefore holy, though having sinners in her midst, because she herself has no other life but the life of grace. If they live her life, her members are sanctified. If they move away from her life, they fall into sins and disorders that prevent the radiation of her sanctity. This is why she suffers and does penance for those offenses, of which she has the power to free her children through the blood of Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was quoting Paul Do you remember that? We heard that one time. CPG there from Paul the Six. Yeah. The Catechism of the, the Credo of the People of God. The Creed of the uh, the Second Vatican Council, oh, which I read like yeah, the ten did. minute thing one time. Yeah, you yeah. did. So I was all from that. Nice. Yeah, I do remember that. Wow, archived episodes. That's right. We're just <laughs> time traveling today. Wow. Okay. If I could turn back time, you gonna start singing? I so want to start oh, singing. I know. What a great song. Yeah, something like that. Is it a great song? <sighs> is it? Is that Tina Turner? I don't know. If I could no who is that anyway i don't know so you know somebody listening to this oh they're yelling shouting oh they're shouting how do you not know that they're either shouting or they're singing they're like pause let's sing this together let's just let's but does anybody know more than just like if i could turn back time i would give it all to you that's all i know yeah i don't know no that's all i know (laughs) all right (laughs) okay um, why do canonization. we canonize saints? Huh? Why do we canonize the faithful? Oh, because people pay enough money, <laughs> right? You pay money, you get canonized. Is that how that works? It is. I always wondered. It is. It's the rich yeah. that make it. Those right. who are flushed mm-hmm. with cash. Right. Yes. Mm. Yep. Yeah. No, we canonize <laughs> to give examples and to recognize God's work mm-hmm. and the, the, to recognize the fact that it's actually possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and to give us examples, people who have lived similar ways to us, have lived similar times to us to show that it's possible to become a saint. Um, so we, we canonize people and to hold them up as examples to show that it's possible. Yeah. And to show the power of the spirit. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. They, the church solemnly proclaims that they've practiced heroic virtue, that they lived in fidelity to God's grace. Here's here's a great line, and this is quoting um, John Paul II. The saints have always been the source and origin of renewal in the most difficult moments in the church's history. Here, here we go. The saints have always been the source and origin of renewal. Remember when we talked about that in the section on the church is one, and mm-hmm. we talked about certain things are required in order to respond to this call toward unity, and the first of that is like a permanent renewal of the church in greater fidelity to her vocation. Well, where does that stem from? Renewal of each and every one of us, like mm-hmm. you and I, not just these people who, yeah, you right. have the capacity for greatness, but me, not so much, right? Like when we are renewed. Yeah. Or the Pope, he can do right. something about it. Seems good. You're a priest, you do it. Yeah. Like, I'm out. Right. <laughs> um, but this is, this is the saints have always been the source and origin of renewal, and this is what we need, right? Mm-hmm. This personal holiness. Um, indeed, holiness is the hidden source and infallible measure of her apostolic activity and missionary zeal. Yes, right? And you've heard that, like, the darker the world gets, um, the brighter 
the lights of the saints, like the more saints that the Lord raises up. And we can see that, like times that were really terrible in the church's mm. history, and they arose from them some of the greatest saints we oh, have. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Church gets really wealthy, and the saints in some ways are like the antidote. So mm-hmm. if the church gets get too wealthy in the 1100s, then you get somebody like Francis of Assisi, the poor man from Assisi comes back and just completely renews the church. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Ah, God's providence. So amazing. Amazing. His power to transform a life and how attractive it is to just magnetize others towards towards him. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more attractive than holiness. That, that's that's true. Truth. Yeah. And again, don't we? I I think um, that is the greatest lie that we have to overcome. Is well, you know, we read we read holy cards of saints, and we read the back, and we like mm-hmm. see the highlights of their life. We're like, well, yeah. I can never do that. Yeah. You know, eating wild locusts and honey, praying hours a day, not for me. But we miss we miss everything that it took into that mm-hmm. to get into that. And so it's just one step at a time, little right. by little, like cooperating with the grace the Lord sends you, uniting yourself with the life of prayer and the sacraments, and over time that produces a capacity of greatness. Yeah. Like it's not overnight. There was a group of videos that the Norbertines out of Los An- out near in Southern California, Norbertines are a monastic religious mm. community. So they put out some videos about just like incredible stories of holiness, kind of like everyday sorts of things. Mm-hmm. They're powerful. Um, but they had the tagline, every, every saint has a past, every sinner mm-hmm. has a future. Mm. Every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. Mm. And, so do you realize that's the second time you've brought up Norbert today? Oh my gosh. Like yeah. St. Norbert is like interceding for us today. I think when is this feast day? Anybody know? Um, Quiz show. I do. It's there. <laughs> it might be January 6th. Okay. So maybe coming up. But don't quote me on that. Okay. I feel like it's the 6th of some month. Okay. But I, and I want to see Jan- say January. Okay. It's not February. You know who's February 6th, right? Paul Meeky and his companions. Oh, okay. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of those obvious, easy yeah. answers, and I totally everybody messed know, it. Everybody know that. <laughs> like he wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> Moses, <laughs> you messing with me? Get out of my class. No, I yeah. didn't say that. That's good. Well, just fun fact, you named the fly you ate Norbert. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then we're talking about the Norbertines here. Oh, man. The last Full par- circle. <laughs> Full circle. Full circle. Oh, in this last paragraph, but while in the most blessed virgin, the church has already reached that perfection whereby she exists without spot or wrinkle, the faithful still strive to conquer sin and increase in holiness. And so they turn their eyes to Mary, and her the church is already, quote unquote, all holy. What a message of hope. Okay. Yeah, especially... When this releases, we would have just celebrated the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception, where we remember and celebrate that Mary was immaculately conceived, Mm -hmm. that she's free from all sin, and that's why she's the image of the church. The church is all holy, Mm -hmm. just like Mary is all holy. So she's like, and she's a mother, the church's mother, so she's Mm -hmm. the image, the image of the church, Mm. mothering us along this path of holiness. Good, good, good. Yeah. Good. That's awesome. Yeah. I love it so much. Yeah. Um, I have to say something. Okay. The dentist jokes. Yeah. So I just have to admit that Grace is not going to the dentist today. She's not? I, I Grace is going to the eye doctor today. But for some reason, I keep, kept thinking she was going to the dentist, and so that's where all the dentist jokes came from today. Um, also, you did not meet the challenge. I did not, but I no. never accepted the challenge. Oh, you I did? I asked what it would be, yeah. And then I was like... <sighs> that is really disappointing. Did he not yeah. accept the challenge he didn't not accept it. I agree. So the challenge before we began recording was how many dentist jokes could Father Sean work in over or under three and a half? We took bets on it, right? Well, that was the that was the thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, you you did zero. Yeah. I guess I did say that. I was pretty confident he could do it zero times. <laughs> yeah, and I did. So I wanted did to live zero. up to expectations. It seemed like nobody wanted dentist jokes. Uh, but you gave the people what they didn't want, and I'm proud of you for that. Thank you. Because normally that's my role. Yeah, right. Well, So thank you. I had to fill in some blanks I've there. I've never you been know? so proud of you, Julia. <laughs> never. Wow. Yeah. It's just got real in here. It did. Yeah. Well, I'm done talking about any, any everything. Are you done? You got yeah. more to say? I don't. Nothing mm-hmm. about... Mm-hmm. The oneness, the the holiness, mm-hmm. the God bless, God bless you. you, the the toothiness. 
<laughs> so you ready yeah, to cross yeah, this off? Say, let's cross this one. Yeah, off. I think so. There were uh, two in brief paragraphs here. The church is one. She acknowledges one Lord, confesses one faith, is born of one baptism, forms only one body, is given life by the one spirit for the sake of one hope at whose fulfillment all divisions will be overcome. The church is holy. The most holy God is her author. Christ, her bridegroom, gave himself up to make her holy. The spirit of holiness gives her life. Since she still includes sinners, she is the sinless one made up of sinners. Her holiness shines in the saints. In Mary, she is already all holy. Hmm. Amen, amen. Okay, where are we going? Why are we to find out? <laughs> Ooh, the creation of the visible world. 337 to 349. Sweet. Yeah. Genesis. (laughs) It's going to be good. Yeah. There's a train very loud outside the window. I'm going to let it pass. It's done. Okay. Uh, So let's end with Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. 